Good. Good morning, everybody. How are you? And Ashley, thank you for the invitation to uh, participate here today. Um, it's very exciting. Hey, good to see you. Lots of familiar faces out there. Um, you know, when Ashley and I got together, what, about six, six and a half years ago? We absolutely saw this transition happening. And, and as Johan pointed out, the multi-channel explosion back in the day, it truly has become this omni-channel. And mobile is absolutely, without a doubt, the frontier that we must all be participating in. Johan was spot on with some of those things. Another statistic that you didn't have out there that I just recently saw, just three years ago, 95% of all internet connections were Windows PCs, 95%. You fast forward to now, it's less than 18%. That transition to applications and mobile devices has just crushed the old paradigm. And so the bland face of a website, it's, it's history. So I absolutely agree with everything we're seeing there. So what we wanted to talk about here was just a bit about how we expand upon that platform-based model that Ashu started to describe around omni-channel, multi-channel, whatever you want to call it, but providing all of those different interaction types to drive business, inside sales, drive customer service and customer sat, and all those key ingredients that are very important to all of us out there. So some of the research that I've brought in today to share with you, we have a group called our uh, advisory board, the board of advisors. It's 52 global brands, all recognizable, and we get together to brainstorm on where they're seeing in financial services, what they're seeing in travel and leisure, what they're seeing in manufacturing and high tech. And we collect this wisdom of the crowds to shape our roadmap. That's what we use as a main input, including Gartner and other analysts as well. But those customers are really the insight that we're looking for to drive where things are going in the future. And so we have representation from one business lead, either a VP or a director of one of these brands, and one technical lead. Because what we find in there, similar to what Johan was talking about of the different needs of these individuals depending on job title, sometimes you get different perspectives from each of those, uh, those different organizations represented. So start a little bit with that and then talk a bit about how this platform's coming together here. So, as I mentioned, the anytime, anywhere, anyhow is just absolutely table stakes these days. If you're not participating in these arenas to drive customer engagement, you're a dinosaur. And I say that very strongly because there is no customer loyalty. Without building an experience, I would say even beyond relationship, without driving an experience, you're going to get left in the dust. And so being participating in all these different environments is very important. The four big mega trends that we continue to see from this advisory board and from other analysis is mobile, as I mentioned. Now, some key things that weren't touched on earlier about mobile. What we're seeing in true deployments around the world on mobile is there's a value to the company and there's a value to the customer. So let me kind of pull those apart a little bit here. For the corporation, it's speed to get to the right person at the right time. For the customer, it's about proactive engagement from the company. So when you have an app, what do you do? You ask them to authenticate, put in their username and password, right? You know who they are now. You don't need IVR to determine who they are anymore, right? You know it straight away. The other is you have context. You know what they were doing at the moment of need. As soon as they push that button for a call, email, chat, video, you know exactly what they were doing where they got stuck. So now you have context being passed to the agent. The agent can be selected based on that context, so you don't have to have an IVR session again. And it allows you to get right to the heart of the question. Okay? The other thing is tying that in with social. And I would say, you know, social is not a destination. It's not your Facebook wall. If you expect customers to come to your Facebook wall, you're just going to get a subsegment of people you're trying to attract. It's finding the customers in the ether and finding the actionable data in that social and location-based services. It's pulling out in the public information of somebody looking for new sunglasses, a new car, for help with their existing product they have from you, and bringing that to the attention and making it actionable within 
your organization, not just waiting for somebody to come to your Facebook wall. Right? That's very reactionary. Customers want to be proactively engaged at the moment of need. And this isn't about spam. This isn't about you know, sending them an offer that has no relevance to them. It has to have relevance or you're going to disconnect and, and, and uh, lose them anyway. So social is very important as an insight into that. The other thing we see very, very active within social is in inside sales, especially financial services, is you get some insight into what's going on with that person. They got in a car accident and posted it on Facebook. Their dog died. Whatever it might be, you have insight into what's going on with them. It builds relationship. It drives experience and relevance for that person as you talk with them. So social is a very useful tool of those engagements there. The other piece on social is if you can turn a bad situation into a good one, you want that to publicly be out there for everybody to see. right? So using social to your advantage is very, very important. But it's not everything. It's one lens and one application use into customer care. On the visual front, it was a great example of Hertz. I see them all the time in, in airports as well. But beyond that, it's really driving consumable video in the power of the hands of your customer. And this is about getting it down to an iPad into an Android device and making it seamless. How many of you, when you try and do something multimedia on a computer and it says Java plugin needed, flash download required, and what do we do? We close the damn thing, right? And who's going to do that? Nobody. In the app and in the HTML5 world, it becomes very seamless. There's nothing for the customer or consumer to do. You take care of it for them on the back end and just make it transparent for them on how they're going to utilize video. The big use cases we're seeing on video right now is show me, like there's something broken, let's take a look at it. The other is talking heads, like Johan was talking about there. That's becoming very popular. And last week in the US, <clears throat> Amazon launched a service called Mayday. Look, I, I encourage you to take a look at it. Inside the new Kindles, when you're reading and you run into an issue of downloading a book or you can't connect or whatever it might be, there's a button there now. You click that button, and what comes up? Video agent. Walks you through whatever your issue is on that, right? They get context of what you were doing because they're on their device. Now, it's a great use case, and it's getting a lot of attention that's going to drive awareness around these types of things. And what's that going to do? It's going to drive your customers to expect that from you. The reality is it's a proprietary stack that goes straight between their things. It's useless to anybody else outside of Amazon, but it's getting the attention out there that your customers are going to expect from you. On the virtual side of things, this is an exciting landscape. The whole concept of machines talking to humans is reality now. We work with a very large insurance company that sits on our board, and if you want to opt in through their app and allow them to monitor your internet-connected vehicle or your home security system, they will monitor that and if my car is downstairs right now and it gets hit while I'm up here, I have no idea. Over the internet sends a message, right quarter panel got in an accident and hit. Why is that important? Because they can proactively set up a claim without me calling them. They have context of what happened and they can find the authorized body shops around the area that they recommend that can service my type of vehicle. That's proactive care at the time of need. This is what, this is what customers are going to learn to expect out of our customer service and inside sales organizations. So virtualized becoming very, very important um, in the overall scheme of things of managing customer care. So on the mobile side of things, as I mentioned earlier, the ability to have live help and that mobile customer care, we see this very, very intimate with the customer and driving that proactive care. Insight authentication, again, as I mentioned. On the proactive reach, lots of retail customers using this capability. When you walk into a mall and you check in, send an offer, send a coupon, get them into the store. Right? The ability to know where they are, and me as somebody that travels quite a bit, I want my credit card company to know where I'm at, and I want them to make offers to me based on what I like to do. Right? If I'm in London this week and I swipe my card at the hotel, that credit card company should say, oh, you know what, Hernandez in his profile likes Premier League soccer. There happens to be a game. Let's get, offer him tickets to that. Right? 
expanding wallet share, but giving me a service that I absolutely want. Again, it can't be spam. It has to be something that's tailored to me as an offer. And then the final one is agents and supervisors being mobile. The ability to do their job on the run. The days of somebody being fixed to a desk and watching that screen go by with the blinking colors is gone. They have to do it as they're coming into the office. They have to do it when they're in the break room. They have to do it when they're out to lunch. And so the ability for them to do their job on a mobile device is just as important as servicing your customer through the mobile. On the video side of things, I touched on a little bit on this on the first slide there, but these are the compelling use cases we're seeing. The immersive telepresence, thanks for the plug on telepresence, by the way. <laughs> immersive telepresence is huge. Retail banking is huge. Why? Because staffing a mortgage specialist at every single bank branch, it's not the way of the future. It's too costly. You're going to have that one individual sitting in a bank branch, maybe sees one or two customers a day, when you can put them into a call center application, put in an immersive, inviting, exciting experience as they walk into the branch, get them in front of that video agent to walk them through, which is the, mo the mortgage specialist in this case, and that person can now service 12 to 20 customers a day. Productivity goes up, costs go down, customer experience increases. Very compelling there. The statistics that we get from all of the financial customers that are doing things like this today is if you can satisfy a customer on their need when they walk into that bank branch, the chances of closing a mortgage go up 75%. That's just real opportunity, right? <laughs> the other is the inter immersive interactive kiosk here. Becoming very popular in malls and shopping areas. If you don't want to take out a lease on a property in that mall, a low cost way to engage customers is through a kiosk. To have it interactive, be entertaining, the gamification's huge. I think that's spot on. Make it a game where they want to participate and engage with you. And through that interactive kiosk, when they run into a challenge or they want to place an order or they want to do something, simply click a button and up comes a video agent to walk them through the steps of what they need to do next. But the big frontier of where it's really exploding is right here. It's in the mobile devices. It's embedded inside of the web page that you have, and it's embedded into the app, seamless into the app. So if I'm on your app and I authenticate and I get in, you can expose a video button. They simply push and it's seamless. Nothing else for that customer to download. It goes right in to your video customer care operations. This is gonna go viral very quickly. Now that Amazon has really made a big splash on it, customers are gonna to learn to expect this out of their engagements with you. Now, some companies look at it and say, well, it comes at a cost, right? It's not free for the companies that are deploying this. You gotta buy the infrastructure, you need the bandwidth, all that good stuff. So what we're seeing is many companies are deciding to profile their customers like we do very, very well. And if it's a high net worth individual working with my financial services, I'm gonna expose it. Right? If it's somebody that just has a consumer checking account, doesn't do much business with it, you're probably not going to put it on there. Just keep it voice is fine for that, that person. So you can profile and decide when is it appropriate to use these types of applications. The other big one I mentioned was Internet of Things. <clears throat> and these are real use cases that these customers, this board that I mentioned earlier, are working on and developing to drive experience with their customers and includes these four key components, people, things, process, and data. So let's pull them apart a little bit here. When we think about people, it's your people. It's the people and the devices and the experiences that they use in their everyday lives. It's the ability to take a multimedia collaboration client and use it to its fullest of engaging with machines and humans that front end face of what they see when they're doing their job and the workflow that comes with it. On the things, it's exploding. I'm telling you, these new sensors out there, it's Johnson Controls, it's Honeywell, it's Rockwell, it's these types of companies that really were never a part of the customer care experience. These are the companies that are creating these sensors and connecting them to the internet. Every day on Facebook I see you know, a new ad <clears throat> come up that has a little tiny, uh, uh, a Wi-Fi connection that you could put on anything. They say, put it on your key ring for your keys, put it on uh, your laptop, and it just tells you where everything's at. That stuff is just flying around the world. 
And those sensors out there provide valuable information on your customers, and they want you to be proactive about it. So taking in all of that sensor information is very, very important. Another big customer uh, use case that's, that's uh, deploying this type of, uh, of stuff is uh, tied into home appliances, right? Home appliances are now connected to the internet. The use case that's very compelling is my freezer is having issues with the ice maker. Sends error code 33333 over to the corporation, looks it up. It's like any other self-service, right? Think of, think of our traditional ways of IVR. What was IVR? Put in some information, get some feedback, self-service. Same thing here. We're just looking up to say, is there a firmware update for that refrigerator that fixes that error code? And if there is, zip it over the internet, install it in the refrigerator. Guess what? Send a note to the consumer and say, hey, company XYZ here, we just fixed your refrigerator. Call us if you have any questions, right? Proactive care at the time of need. Now, what happens if you need to turn a wrench? You need somebody to go out there and physically change a compressor, right? Then it comes over with a different error code, of course. And when that comes in, the decision is made, we need assisted service. This can't be handled with a firmware download. And so the assisted service, and where this company sees huge dollars, is you got customers that are under warranty, maybe 12 months and less. But the vast majority of their customers have no warranty. They have no maintenance contract. So what does it go? It goes to inside sales. And this company is ramping up a big inside sales team to get that information, reach out to the customer based on their profile and what they want, and sell them service. The customer needs it, it's timely, it's not spam, and it drives revenue. All the right things coming together there. So the other piece of it is all this data. There's just so much data out there. The key here is understanding through business process what is actionable. You, want, you don't want to take action on every single thing coming in. And so the aggregators are taking this data, analyzing it, and producing just the things that are actionable that then go into this process, which is the routing engine. The beauty of the call center routing engine is that it has expanded to take decision making beyond, I have this caller coming in with this profile, with this question, match them up. It's now saying, hey, I got a car in queue sending that information over and I need to get it to an agent that can start this claim process. That routing engine will route any of those types of transactions and interactions you're looking for and put the same process that we love in call centers, which is what? Reporting and metrics and analytics. That's what we live and die by because we can fine tune everything that way. It's just another interaction coming in on that. The one last one I'll leave you with is a medical supply company that uh, sells large equipment to uh, hospitals. And so what they're looking at utilizing this for is all that medical equipment out there needs service, of course. Their cost, their loaded cost, all in to send somebody out to look at that device, $2,500. Outrageous. Big, big company with lots of cost just to get somebody out to take a look at it. Now, if they don't know what's going on with it, they go out there, diagnose it, and then they have to come back. Now they've spent $5,000 on one interaction to fix it. With this type of capability, they can get the error code, get some information, do some root cause analysis. They can also use video with the person from IT that's in the hospital that can take a look and show them what's going on. Now, all of a sudden, they're doing remote diagnostics, and they're only showing up to fix the thing, not to do troubleshooting. Huge cost savings, big customer satisfaction. It's spreading everywhere with these types of things. So I would encourage you to think about your organizations, how you can engage with your customers at this level to be proactive in that engagement. So when we look at this in customer consumption, let's say, in company consumption, your corporations, this is what that board is telling us that companies look at. You gotta have cost optimization, right? There's no doubt about it. You gotta save costs if you're gonna invest in other areas. There's, it's just table stakes. But if you don't quickly move into relationship building, as was mentioned earlier, you're gonna turn off and it's gonna become a price game. That's what it ultimately does. Think about yourself in a personal life. That's what you do, right? Why would your customers be any different? But where it's quickly going is an experience. I would say gamification is in that experience, right? Driving that proactive care and insight, very important. And what we see happening is you start moving 
from pure transactions into true engagement. And one of the challenges of the past with these siloed approaches, these point solutions, these point product deployments that Ash, you mentioned earlier, is that you get multiple views of a single interaction. Meaning, if I come in through your web page, I do a chat, and then I email, and then I call you, traditional systems are not architected to allow you to group all that together as a single engagement. But to a customer, that's just one engagement. And you're treating them differently based on the channel they're coming into and not looking at it as one total engagement. Customers expect more these days. And so when you look at some of the things and the changes that have happened, those traditional ACDs of the past, they're dead, right? They're dead. And I know there's still a lot of them out there. TDM-based phone systems, they're dead. They can't move into this new world. And we tried in the industry to do these things around CTI and all these cool tricks. Fragile, costly. So as we start moving into this engagement model, it's more of an application platform model that enables all of these omni-channel type experiences that you can deploy based on use. You're not gonna put every agent on video, as Johan mentioned, for all the right reasons. You're not gonna put every one of them on chat. So you're gonna put in a platform that allows you to say, give me five of this type of agent, give me 10 of this type of agent, and so on, which makes it consumable by you at a better price, but gets you to that engagement model which your customers are looking for. And what you ultimately end up in is moving from a place to an enterprise service. It's not a physical place that all these people need to go anymore. You can spread them all over the place. It's an enterprise service that allows them to work from home if you care to do so. We have a customer that sits on the board and they're an online travel company. And what they found in moving to engagement was relevance to the buyer at the time of need. And so as they come in to either their call center or through the web, if they need assisted service, they only speak to an employee that's visited the city of choice that this person's looking to travel to. So if I'm online and I say, you know what? I'm thinking about going to Sydney, Australia. Can't wait, right? Summer's coming up there. And so I look on that and I need some help in booking that. I only get to speak to an agent that has been to Sydney, Australia. And what they found through that is higher rate of close. You got relevance. But equally as important, they're driving wallet share. They're not just selling them the airline ticket in the hotel. They're now selling them tours because they have relevance. Uh, boy, when I was there, I remember doing this in Sydney Harbor and selling that extra thing. So that engagement, customers love it, and it drives more revenue for you guys. And then the final thing here is we see companies moving from pure operational plays and fine-tuning each of those things to get a little bit more out of each of them into true brand management. And all of this is incorporated into proactive services. Consumers, customers, business customers, and consumers expect this now. They do it in their personal lives, so they expect it from you if you're going to keep them as a customer. So as I mentioned earlier, a number of years ago, Ashu and I entered into a relationship as we saw this happening, that customers like yourselves, many in the room here, were telling us you need to pull these things together in a more seamless way instead of us trying to deploy all of these silos. Bring it together, all of the channels, right? And so we entered into this relationship uh, many years ago and have seen tremendous uptake of the applications in that platform type model I mentioned. The beauty is the industry, as Ash, you mentioned, has recognized us both in the magic quadrant here from Gartner as the leaders in our space here. So you take the best of both of us, and you see the applications we bring to the table here, and when you combine us together, one plus one does equal three in this case. The ability to drive a differentiated experience for your employees, your supervisors, the ability for your executives to have the right level of information that gives them the insight of how things are operating and how the business is doing, and the unlimited channels of choice for your customers to be seen as a single interaction brought together on the desktop for that agent. The other thing that's changed dramatically is technology has advanced in the world. And so these thick client, CTI heavy desktops of the past, boy, fragile, difficult to work on, expensive. I know many customers, when they deploy it, they don't touch it. Boy, you touch it, it's gonna break. Leave it alone, right? It's moved to web services now. Open containers, gadgets, and widgets just like iGoogle. We're all used to that in our lives, right? 
Everybody has a Google financial page that we've made very easily as a customer, a consumer of digesting that information. Same goes for agent desktops now. The ability to mix and match applications because all the functionality are now just simple little gadgets you can put in your own container desktop or in the container that we distribute. Makes it very simple to consume. Now, what we find from customers, and when I mean customers, I mean agents, <coughs> those agents are more engaged. It's a new updated view. It's engaging and dynamic. Keeps them on their toes. Because being an agent, it's boring. You're sitting there all day long, over and over and over and over and over again. A little bit of gamification at the desktop for the agent is very important as well. And so tying that stuff together to get your employees to be engaged, they're the face or voice of your company. You want them to be inspired to sell or support whatever you guys are selling or are producing as a product or service. So as Ashu mentioned, the pre-integration of these customer engagement solutions is very, very important. We went so far because we felt very strongly about this position in the marketplace. And if any of you look at any of the analysts' market share data these days, it's, the market is responding very, very well to this. And what we looked at was, how do we get Ashu's products, his services, embedded into my platform and distribute it globally? And so we entered into a relationship where we can now sell and support eGains applications globally. We've been doing that for what, about four years now. Strong, strong take up in the marketplace based on that. Removing the silos and driving these types of interactions very easily for you in your operations and to your customers and consumers. And so the final thing here that we'll look at architecture a little bit, coming from Cisco, it wouldn't be a presentation without an architectural slide, sorry. I gotta give you a little bit of the architecture. I'm a technologist at heart, although I'm also a consumer and I'm very, very demanding on the companies I do business with as well. But when you look at these, these building blocks here, and uh, are these slides gonna be available for everybody, I assume? So no need to take notes on this. We'll get these to you so you can see all these things that are at play. But here's how we all come into place. On the call center, it's the Cisco solution. On, on these other areas, it's all eGain. On the social, it's eGain social apps, face-to-face -face interaction, it's Cisco remote expert, and so on. We've put time, energy, and thought into how we package these things together to deliver that overall solution to the marketplace that drives what Ashley was talking about on that seamless experience and not point solutions. And we've empowered all of our resellers globally to take these things to market because it's better business for them, it's better consumption by you, it works for everybody around the board. So the last thing on the architecture here, and again, these will be available for you. These are the building blocks. And as we sat down with Ashu, is looking at who brings what to the table. So again, these will be available for you. But we look at the network and data services, very important, especially as software-defined networking takes off. And basically, software-defined networking means you can change the network to do things based on events happening. Increase bandwidth for video quickly, quality of service. Those types of things can be manipulated now dynamically. And then you add on to the contact center services that are participating there, and then the presentation layer of how the agent and the supervisor absorb this. And then the key things eGain rounds out the portfolio for on this platform model into the marketplace here. So again, Ashley, thank you very much for the invitation to come and share some information with the folks here. Um, thank you for the relationship over the years. Uh, we're looking forward to continued success for us in the marketplace. And I'll be around for a few minutes if anybody has any more questions. Much thank you very much. much. Absolutely, I'm keeping you not, so you think you're gonna get away, huh? Mm, I, I saw that. <laughs> <clears throat> any questions? Come on, there has to be one question. Mm. No. Nope. Thank you. Uh, just hang on, we've got the microphones coming through. Um, I firstly would say that was a very impressive presentation. Um, the key thing for me coming out of it is the potential of the joined up eGain and Cisco solutions. I have eGain, I don't have Cisco, I have an Avaya investment that I can't get rid of. What's your advice to me? <laughs> give me your card. I'll give you my card. <laughs> no, you know, it, it, it's a serious question because there's lots of customers in that position. 
Um, and what we see happening is it's important to take in all aspects using another vendor. And the genesis of that is <laughs> <laughs> the Avaya solution uh, was great for its time and what it was used for. But what we found was, because in the early days, we would go in and we would tell you straight up, hey, rip that thing out, put this in, and everything's going to be rosy. It wasn't rosy. You know why? Because there were some simple things that were missing, like my, my supervisors love CMS. What do I do without CMS? Are you kidding me? I can't live without CMS. So you know what we did? We said, you know what? Because every Monday morning, I would get all these escalations because of that. So what we did is we just took the CMS type templates, terminology, put it into our web reporting. Supervisors can still use CMS. It's just in a different, different world, right? And it got over some of those humps. So we've done a lot of those types of things to help with migration, to get into the new application platform model with taking out some of the risk. Nobody likes risk in call centers. Nobody likes to tell the CEO, oh, sorry, inside sales is down and we're not producing any money for you today. Nobody wants to have that conversation. So what we've put in very, very stringent regulations on our VARs and SIs. Some of them are in the room here today to make sure that they're trained appropriately to reduce that risk for you, but also give you the tools that allow for your employees to make that jump as well. Because it's more than a technology. It's an HR process change as well. And so having all of those things, we've got lots of methodologies. We've done 17,000 of those transitions so far. So we got a big track history in that. Love to help you with that. I see a few of the, 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 the resellers in the room here. I'm sure they're going to attack you at lunch, so be ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. For that. Any other questions? Great. Well, Thank now you very much. I will let you look. All right. Go. Thank you so much. <clears throat>